Hello, universe. Well, it must still be the year of fat lick scab, huh, kitty? Ugh. You mind getting off the bed with that? Ugh. Pause. Kitty, right there. They're on the ground. I don't have them. They're right there. How do you not see them? What are you doing? Those are catnip treats. You love those. What is wrong with you? Well, we're not going to talk about the cat. And what is wrong with her is too many things to put on this recording. Come on, kitty. Go. Get him. Yeah, there you go. Oh, you did it. Boy, she's like coaxing a... <sighs> well, she's all I got. So, talking negatively about her, I will not. In fact, in this spot, instead of promoting that scabby rot, um... The year of the cat scab, licking, is in direct reference to the one pet I still have in life. Whereas last year's year, the year of the goofy dog gets goofier, or whatever I called it, well, that was my Labradoodle, who was a goofy dog. But I loved that Labradoodle. And uh, when she went down in August, um, I, I think I went into a little bit of a... a state of uh, loneliness for the first time in a long time. I mean, the cat does what the cat does, right? But the dog was a constant companion. One I underestimated in terms of the emotional vibration I was able to uh, reverberate with her. Her constant upbeat, never seemingly having a bad minute way of life was soothing, especially for somebody who's um, imprintable with the fluttering of whatever emotional vibration might be directly around me. And I know, know all this, and I knew all this at the time, and I've never taken it for granted. I just didn't know how much I would miss that presence in my life. Because... I don't really have somebody that I've ever been open with. I mean, part of the reason that I decided to go through with this project was when Lily entered my life, it was coincidentally right about when I stopped lying. I probably had stopped lying for a little while before that, but I wasn't cognizant of it until Lily's presence in my life was cemented. And I, <clears throat> in some ways, <laughs> uh, have always thought of Lily as my guardian angel. Because my life really turned around about the year she got into it. And then the next four years, I just started stacking up internal fortitude, brick by brick by brick. In many ways, from the learning experiences she was providing me. And it is a very selfish way to talk about Lily. She is not a subject in a life-run, observational um, investigation of all human characteristics to see which ones it is that y'all use because I just don't understand the human condition. Well, it was a little of that. I mean, shit, it was a lot of that. If there was one wish I probably had in my life that I didn't really ever register consciously but probably sat in my subconscious from about the age of 13 on, it would be to have a fucking really crazy-ass roommate. Just a fucking either criminal or lunatic. And let's face it, if you have to choose between the two, I'll take the lunatic. Although with lunatic comes criminal. But I think with criminal comes lunatic, so I'd rather have the, yeah, whatever. It's like sativa indica. I'll take the sativa. But when 
when she walked in my back door, and I, I've explained this backstory enough that I, I'm not going to get into it, but Lily is a delusional schizophrenic who I have no connection with whatsoever, walks in my back door on a, on a warm uh, evening night in like February. It was like 70 degrees for a couple days in January or February. I'm not sure what month she walked in the door now, but um, I honestly thought I was being pranked by a friend of mine who I was expecting to see a couple of hours later. What I thought was happening was that she had sent her friend who she'd been talking about a little bit and whatever. She was going to uh, have her friend stop by with her. They were going to come by together. I had um, talked to her on the phone, but I had never seen her in person. And that's who I thought had walked in my back door and was doing this incredible job of play acting. Um dissociative or uh, delusional schizophrenic. Um, I was wrong. It turns out that this was just a delusional schizophrenic. My friend actually never came by that night because once she found out what was happening, she was like, fuck, I'm not coming over. Um, so after encouraging this a little bit, because honestly, I didn't put one and one together and come up with two. I put one and one together and came up with 3.14159265.3. I came up with the irrational moment in time that it is to interact with a delusional schizophrenic without knowing it until you know it, which was about somewhere between 45 minutes and two hours into it. By two hours into it, you couldn't deny it. At 45 minutes into it, you're like, holy fuck, is this person faking this or is this a goddamn real problem, and I should be calling the police. Okay, so how does this person become a guardian angel? Well, for one, they walked in my back door. Nobody else has ever walked in my back door. So, there's that. Um, two, if I could have wished for somebody to have a intimate enough view of to see their real inner workings as a point of curiosity, I would have picked a delusional schizophrenic. Because it's such a, a compromised state of mind that it's clinically fascinating. Now, that does make Lily sound like a lab rat. And in that way, I was treating her like one. Which is kind of awful. And I take accountability for that. And I always even told her, in real time, that a lot of what I got in value in our friendship was being able to help her converse through the static and noise that she was willing to discuss. I enjoyed our conversations. I never once treated her as anything less than equal. And I think in some ways, I believed that perhaps the one thing missing from anyone's life where their mind is breaking is just someone not telling them they're broken. And that's all I tried to do for Lily, is say, I don't think you're broken. I think you have plenty of ways to live a life that means something to you. It's just a question of figuring out how you're going to do that. That was essentially my entire attitude toward her. And I think in retrospect, that was a little too lenient. Or was it? I don't know. Because what Lily does when huh, given too much rope is she tends to hang herself, number one. And number two, she is vindictive about slights that don't even necessarily happen, but are in her delusional states. So whatever you're going to allow, you're going to permit her to violate your space uh, without any concern about boundaries. 
So I had to give up hmm, privacy. Uh, I had to give up organization. I had to give up knowing where anything in my fucking house was. Um, I gave up uh, things that, in retrospect, were just the simple accommodations of allowing Lily to be Lily in my space. And I don't know that she ever got there, but the the ways that <clears throat> being around her made me think about myself and my own sense of self-loathing, maybe, or uh, my own tendency to dwell on deficiencies within instead of potential without or potential within. Not treating myself as well as I treated the people around me that I cared about. Um, and then taking the reality uh, knock I deserved for being a little too naive about what makes people hurt. And Lily had a lot of hurt in her that was high-level hurt. And I never really even got into it, never touched it, because it was something that she couldn't speak to without veering off into delusional protection territory. So whatever it is, it was too harsh and still vivid to bring up even in some of our better connective conversations. And we have, I have a taped, I have ser uh, probably 20 recordings, if not 100. I don't really know how many, especially because Lily would do it on, <laughs> unbeknownst to me. She'd be recording us all the time, frankly. But when I would set the recorder on the table and say, let's just talk, I have probably 20 real conversations with her. Now, her side of the conversation is challenging as hell to follow. But it's not, it's, it's dialogue of, of, um, of equal footing. And even in her, um, even in her distortions, it was never something that, that, uh, I looked at as, as, um, as anything other than the way Lily is. When you're saying these things to me, Lily, are you trying to imply something or are you literally asking me to consider uh, the uh, haircut that Keanu Reeves is getting this week? Is that is that topical material or are you talking something more about beauty standards and the haircut you gave yourself this morning? And then inevitably we'd be talking about the fact that, you know, whatever. My, my thing is, none of it worked. <laughs> like... Um, well, I can't say none of it worked because in the time I knew her, she had, she started three jobs. She lost all three, but she, she was always try, motivated to try to earn money until the last couple months when she just, something changed in her and she just really quit. She just, she could be the most cynical person on, on the planet by a lot. Um, but she also had some reason to be so fucking cynical. She'd been in institutionalized from about 14 on in different capacities, in different um, settings, some horrific. Um, and, and yet on her medication, she could be a lot less uh, uh, extreme, but to the point she was dull. You could see the, the sort of um, the fuzz in her thinking, she couldn't ever. She she wasn't snappy at all, and she would she would uh, she would have trouble retaining simple. Uh, it would it it was very much the the same thing that the connotation about the quote unquote uh, pothead. That's what she was like. Um, you couldn't get her to boil water and remember that it was for pasta in the same ten minute frame. Um, but. Those things aside, um, I always liked Lily, and and so when she when she did some things to really uh, upset my life, it was 
it was um, uh, it was the kind of destructive uh, element that took us from friends to something else. And kind of like when BFFs break up in high school, it's not like you just have, you come to a realization that there's a limit to what's between you that is healthy versus what can easily become something very uh, volatile and uh, and Lily loving to play the role of the catalyst. Well, taught me again and again and again and again and again forgiveness, patience, and understanding. And to be kind. Just be kind. Kindness was what Lily needed more than anything when she was most deluded. And some mac and cheese. But since she couldn't remember why we were boiling the fucking water, it took forever to make mac and cheese. So sometimes, by the time it got done, she wouldn't even be hungry. And... This this is how bad Lily's op opposition stuff was. If all we had in the house to eat was mac and cheese, and she knew this on Tuesday. On Wednesday, if I knew she was getting off work, say, at 6, and I was making dinner, I would just make mac and cheese and have it ready and go, here's the mac and cheese. She'd be like, ah, I don't want this. Lily, yesterday we were saying, this is all we had, this is what we're going to eat tonight. Why are we not following through on this? Well, that was yesterday. And now I'm in the mood for... I mean, no matter what situation it was, she was unhappy about the result and wanted something different. And it once you got to be okay with the fact that this couldn't be stopped, it was kind of fun because you could use it against her. And then she'd try to figure out if she was getting gamed so you could double-cross her. <laughs> so, so, and I mean... All in good fun, mostly to figure out, I mean, we must have had maybe 10 meals together in the six years we knew each other because there was so much disconnect, even about the fucking time we were going to eat. I would say, I'll eat from one o'clock till one o'clock and let you pick whatever you want. I'll even let you pick spontaneously and be ready to cook instantly when you're ready to go. But then there'd be issues. So, <clears throat> so Lily asked a lot of me in just giving her the space to not be told she was a problem. But the truth was, she was a problem. I mean, she killed my dog. That was problematic. She blew a rape whistle in the backyard at 4 a.m. for about 45 seconds till I could get to her. Not understanding whatsoever what she was implying. She had the police show up at the house twice. Neighbors called. I mean, she was a problem. I mean, fuck, she... I'm the, I still don't know where some shit in my house is. And... So it wasn't all upside, right? But my guardian angel was going to come in the back door as a delusional schizophrenic to teach me the lessons I most needed to course correct in real time at that point when I knew I had an opportunity to become something bigger than I had been. And bam, in walks Lily. Full of those kinds of lessons. So, since then, that was 2017, beginning of 2017, I've really changed fundamentally from the bottom all the way through. And a couple of my foundational stones in that process were cemented in place through my interaction with Lily. And my other foundational stones are in place through my own self-inspection and determination of who I really am without another uh, agent cooperating me into that realization. So I really think of Lily as the person who started this process with me. And I thought, 
I might be helping her start a process with in herself, but again, that is giving myself more skill and credit and impact than I ever had. And I don't regret anything about how I treated Lily, especially because I had contact with her family. There was, there was nothing here that was improper or even um, other than hoping the best for her, wanting the best for her, encouraging her to do her best and always being okay when she couldn't do it. I wanted Lily to feel like the only thing that we knew for sure was she wasn't the problem. And whatever other problems we could come up with, we'd fix. But there was either, either four-ish years of that with admittedly a two-year gap while she was incarcerated. Um, it's, it, it either was way too short a period of time to see change or impact, or I had barked up the wrong tree, as it were. It was, it was clear at the end of the four years that in many ways, Lily's life hadn't gotten better, but had gotten worse. And sure, the incarceration and some of that stuff she brought on herself, or who knows. But I saw three or four unique instances in life where she was handed an olive branch of, oh my God, that's such a great opportunity. You're so lucky that's happening for you. you got to take advantage. And fucked it off. So she was a tough person to be around. Because of all the people who would do try to offer her help. Nope. And and stuff that was extremely useful for her just day-to-day -day process of getting through life, like free legal advice from a real lawyer in a situation where she needed it. Nope. Blow off the court date. Don't even show up. Even though six people are in that courtroom waiting for you. But then... Six people in that courtroom waiting for her means she's got to be something that they all want her to be. And she doesn't know if she can do that. Ever. Even if it's just me who doesn't give a shit who shows up. It still makes it hard to figure out how to adjust to a world that keeps telling you you're broken. So... When that person <clears throat> essentially says, yeah, yeah, we can be friends for four years, sort of. Well, friends is a strong word, but we'll call ourselves friends and we'll even have moments of friendship, but I'll kill your dog and you'll threaten to kill me with a knife and we'll wonder what the fuck's going wrong with ourselves because we'll have gotten to that point, but then that'll be a life lesson that you'll always learn something about yourself that you didn't know until right then. What it means to ultimately forgive someone for what you would consider the worst thing that could happen to you in the moment. Hmm. All right. Grab your stuff. You can have the second bedroom. But what I don't want you to do is feed my dog human food. Oh, fuck. She did that. I do still sort of blame Lily for Phoebe's 12-year short run. Because at seven, when Lily met Phoebe, she was one healthy-ass dog. But by eight, well, not only had she gained a taste for human food, thanks Lily, but she was now full of tumors. So, okay, that's a little bit of a stretch. I'm sure Lily didn't cause Phoebe's illness. Or am I? Pause. That's not even really what I got on to talk about. Oh, and I forgot. It's Bronco football night. So my open mic night was canceled. But since I have to be at work at midnight, and it's now, uh, what time is it? It is 6.41 on the 12th of October. And I have, I have a new bit that I'm trying to craft about how much I appreciate 
the open space for free speech that has been created in the comedy open mic night scene. And as a, um, as a, uh, perhaps final common gathering, uh, activity other than maybe poetry slams or, um, I don't know what else. Um, uh, I don't know. I really don't. I mean, that's hard to think of because it's not church. It's not bowling teams. It's not book clubs. It's not, it's, it's really not talent shows. I mean, it's, I don't know where else is the point of the activity to get up and say what you have to say. Well, it is at open mic nights. So, <clears throat> well, this actually lends a little bit of weight to my argument, which is, I've now been um, to about, let's say, 50 of them. And um, so I've gotten to know, let's say, 150 aspiring comedians, of which I can probably name 60 of them. Um, in that huge group of sort of communal collective uh, cast of characters. Well, doesn't somebody have to be CIA or FBI or NSA or whatever the fuck, right? I mean, or or at least maybe one of each, right? And, and I wouldn't even say that Colorado State Patrol and Denver Police might not be involved or Lakewood Police or whoever, right? I'm just saying, you'd think with all the infiltration that's occurring in our society when it comes to groups with the opportunity to become subversive entities? Well, a room full of disenchanted comedians, that's a no-brainer. Of course the CIA, FBI, NSA, and Mossad, MI6. Hell, the French are probably in there. Is there a French-speaking guy? I think there is. Maybe. I mean, when I think of the cast of characters that are running around the sort of central um, nuclei of these open mics, well, <laughs> I mean, the first guy that comes to mind is obvious, and that's Josh Beaver. He's got the name for it, for fuck's sake, right? But... <laughs> I just, I don't know, it, it, he's either too good at what he's doing, or he's authentic, right? I mean, uh, mm -hmm. but that's why it's such a captivating possibility. Well, anyway, in having gotten to know these people enough, that I can start to narrow the list down as to why I don't think it's necessarily this comedian, or this one, or this comedian, or this comic, until you get to me, if anybody in that room is CIA, well, fuck. I mean, come on. Obviously. Okay, so in honor of the Broncos having um, so much cultural influence that they can shut down open mic comedy nights in bars that have TVs showing NFL football games, well, thanks to those guys who I used to Worship like they walked on water. Hello, John Elway. I love you. Still love you. I have your autograph. I love you. Um, we have the same birthday, too. That just makes me think, ah, oh, why do you have to turn out to be such a different dude than the one that won Super Bowls? But having never won a Super Bowl, maybe that's just what happens to people. Tonight, having never won a Super Bowl, well, I'm going to use my exercise routine as the inner, uh, uh, ki oh, kitty. <sighs> okay. I'll be back after I've worked out a little bit and then we'll talk more. Bye. Uh, okay. I haven't worked out yet, but I have my, my cat has taken to looking at me in the mirror. Like I'd say we make more eye contact with her perched in the corner 
angling her view. Oh, great. Angling her view at me from a, a dresser mirror than we do face to face. Like, it's weird how much she seeks me out in the mirror instead of just looking at me. Is that a thing cats do? This is something that's new for her. Mostly because the only place that in my room is truly warm is on top of that speaker. So, maybe it's just the easy way for her to look at me, but fuck. It's a little spooky. That cat spooks me out. If that's a phrase. Creeps me out? Weirds me out? Whatever it is, she does it. Pause. Okay, uh, so, after implying that I am a CIA agent infiltrating a open mic night free speech scene. Well, then I immediately say, okay, let's think about something else that is at least half of what distracts me lately. And that is the concept of a Messiah, a savior, the chosen one, the son of God, daughter of Terra, whatever. This embodiment of, of unique goodness and forthright action that they will save humanity from this plight they have created for themselves, this terrible, organized, piss-poor life we're all li living. Uh-huh. I just don't get it. I don't get anything about it. Well, I mean, I do get one thing about it. But the need to be babysat is what I keep coming back to here. What, what are we... Is it, <clears throat> is it all that time we spend useless as infants and toddlers and tiny babies, children, kindergartners, whatever? I mean, when do you first throw a kid into the wild and think, he'll definitely survive? Well, your average kid, not your kid from 300, but instead of King Leonidas, you're going to send in uh, Shaggy from Scooby-Doo. What's he got to be, at least 16 before he has a chance? Maybe 18? Okay, maybe 12. But until you have double digits under your belt, the chances of you surviving in any circumstance on your own as an infant are small. A nine-year-old versus the Mall of America. I like the Mall of America to win that one. That nine-year-old's going to be found somewhere in a escalator injury situation that's just going to be covered up. Because you know where he won't be talked about? At the open mic comedy nights. Because that subject... Oh, yeah, no, that's where he will be talked about. That'll be fucking funny. Let's hope, no, let's not hope that happens. We don't want to see children dying in escalator incidents at the Mall of America. But for comedy's sake, the chaos needs to reign. The unexpected needs to keep happening. The truth is that comedy needs a savior. It needs someone to accept the responsibility for moving forward in a paradigm that could be better, that needs to be better, that needs to be funny, frankly. And <clears throat> that's why you have to get into thinking about, well, if they do exist, why aren't they here? Now's the time, right? I mean, if it's not when Israel and Palestine are having a war, that the Savior shows up, then I don't know anything about that Bible book people are talking about. There seems to be enough of a this feels right to this time that you'd think the Savior would be here. Or at least have left us a text message that they're on their way. So there seems to be none of that happening. Therefore, I'm going to stick with my evidence-based reality that I try to live inside of at all times, which says, we made them up. They don't exist. There is no such thing. Prove it. Show me 
anybody with even an inkling toward a special ability like bringing back the dead or walking on water or taming, turning any other liquid into wine. So if you can't do any of that, then mm, I got nothing here but the idea that we made them up. Now that I like a lot because making things up well, humans are good at that. We're liars. We are, by our nature, insecure little specks of insignificance that once realized, well, we come out all full of ourselves, pretending it's make, fake it till you make it time, and so we lie our asses off about how vulnerable we really know we are. And we kind of accept this because we all kind of do it. And I, I took that to the nth degree. I was a prolific liar. Which is why I'm so concerned about speaking anything at all now that I don't accept as fully accountable truth coming out of my mouth. I will never say something that I can't back up with complete rational conviction or emotional conviction in the future. I, I stand by what I've said. I am not going to need to rethink what I'm calling my convictions unless they are confronted or challenged by something that fundamentally makes me rethink my convictions. I am not changing who I am. I am who I am. Speaking truth means I don't have to think about what I said because what I said was true. If everything that comes out of my mouth is the truth, I stand by all of it. And that level of accountability, well, you start to see yourself change a little bit from being a guy who wonders if, am I the Antichrist? I mean, that seems like I act like him sometimes. Do you, do you have to be full-on Antichrist? To be the Antichrist, or does that just kind of start to emerge in you? I don't even know. These are the questions I'm asking myself in my 30s. As I'm doing another thing that I think is morally reprehensible. But <clears throat> enjoyable in the moment, because that's what shallow people do. Or people filled with self-loathing, or whatever other current spell was overwhelming me. But when you try to work your way out of those things, but you, you don't believe in yourself, you don't love yourself enough to actually move through the steps necessary to become something better, well, then you just tack another facade on, hoping it fits, hoping it molds you into the thing that you know inside you're trying to be, but you just can't make it work. Well, you start realizing in about a year, 18 month gap from when I think things originate that all those failed attempts in your 30s and even into your 40s. Well, something must have stuck because when you look at your last short-term memory part of life, you can't even remember the last time you told a lie. And you can specifically remember a couple of uncomfortable truths that in every other circumstance in life that that was on the conversation option list, it was not chosen. You, you turtled up there and gave a little bit of a protection lie to keep from exposing those inner truths. But now, in the last six months, boy, have I been spilling those things out like I've newly composed like I'm not afraid of what people think of me like I just realized how much value I bring to the table all of a sudden I'm feeling these notions of purpose this confident idea of what I'm supposed to do and who I am I'm just becoming a more integrity-based person, things that have never happened to me. And I'm gaining conviction and forthright 
attitude that I believe in and am embodying in my reality, it's leading to these conversational blurts that I've never even considered sharing. And here I am just exposing myself. And then you start to find yourself more effective in so many ways. Well, having not been brought up religious, not having any real sense of (laughs) the belief that a Messiah exists, well, when you start to see your life unfold in a way that feels almost predestined to glory? Well, I mean, you start to understand what this Messiah thing could be about, right? All right, I'm back. And uh, there comes a time, sorry for the clickety-clack, there comes a time in your workout routine where it's more mental than physical to make it through. And I knew I was there the last time I was on the Nordic track because I got to 11 and a half minutes, which was, well, no, hang on. I had gotten to 11 minutes and three seconds in my previous attempt to get to 15 minutes. Then I had to get off, get back on for a minute and a half, get off again, get back on for two and a half minutes. So the next day, In my head, I'm thinking I should be strong enough to get to 15 minutes today. And I struggled to get to 11 minutes and four seconds. Because every day I feel like I have to at least get further than I got the last day if I'm not going to make it to my goal. Then I can stop, then I can get back on and finish my task. But to only get to 11 minutes and four seconds was so disappointing because when I got back on, I could only get, I didn't even get to 12 minutes. I could only make it like 35 seconds before my legs literally were like quivering and cramping. And I was plenty hydrated. It was just, I think, I don't know what I think. Because today I had set, set my goals back some, tolerating getting it done in three sessions. So if I had to quit at eight minutes and then quit at 12 and then quit at 15, I was going to be okay with that. Instead of having to get to 11.5. Well, when I got to seven minutes and was cruising, I thought, well, fuck, where has this been? Like, I'm in pretty good shape. The fact that the first 10 days were feeling more onerous than I remember the Nordic track even presenting was starting to make me feel old. But not only did I give myself an opportunity to take a break while doing my uh, aerobic, then I was going to allow myself to record before I did my core exercises if I felt like it. And then I was going to let myself record before I did my weight exercises if I felt like it. And even in between any of the weight exercises if I got too tired. And for the first time since I started exercising again, I made it through my whole cycle without a pause. So, where the fuck did that come from? Because I was ready to give myself the ultimate free pass, at least tonight, especially because I still got to go to work. I got seven hours of lifting boxes up and down stairs to deal with, but I'm starting to, to reinvigorate the strength in the muscles that I'm using instead of the weakness. And I feel great right now. One of the things you have to force yourself to do if you want to have the healthiest version of yourself is to get regular exercise. And yeah, that can be as burdensome a task in your life as you can set. And at some point, everybody gives up the energy to keep going because other priorities somehow take precedent. But that should only be temporary. Never is there a time when you're not better off for having gotten something physically exerted in your day. Male or female, your body responds well to this. And the way the universe is composed, for all pain, there is pleasure. If you're willing to endure sacrifice, you will be given reward. 
And a lot of times I set myself up in a position to stay balanced instead of realizing I could dive into some sacrifice for some future reward to return itself in unexpected ways. I don't have to always just be shooting for balanced, centered, tranquil. But that's where I'm at my best. I mean, you certainly don't want me on the extreme. I know that. <laughs>